seven, like we said we would, and those who are late, unfortunately, will miss the beginning. Um, guys, I'm Can. Carol, whenever you are you ready, you want to say something and we'll start. Yeah. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Carol. I work for the ACI. Um, I've had the pleasure of traveling with Michael on four or five trips over the years. And um, Michael manages to enhance our visit with his knowledge and his enthusiasm and bringing Yadut and Jewish history of the places we visit. And you're gonna experience uh, this this evening. So welcome to you all. Thank you for joining us. And I'm happily handing over the mic to Michael. All the best. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Hanukkah Sameach. I hope you all can all hear me and that the Zoom will, session will work well. Well, I'd like to ask everyone to mute, to put the uh, mute sign you have there so everybody can hear. And then uh, in the end, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer then you can uh, unmute again. And uh, I'm happy to be here with, uh, with you, even though it's only a Zoom meeting. We are all grounded for the last year, but uh, so the world had uh, on hold for us, had to wait for us to come back. But um, hopefully we'll be able to uh, travel and to, do, uh, to go get back to our old programs. What I'm going to share with you this evening is something that I experienced and investigated and I wrote about it also in my newspaper and a few articles. It's a very fascinating topic that um, I happened to uh, get to know it uh, from uh, meeting my, one of my cousins. Uh, that she, she, I have a Japanese cousin, yes, she lives in, she lived in Japan, now she made Aliyah, she lives in Israel now. She is Jewish, she's married to a Japanese. She was married to a Japanese. And um, she told me something about uh, some kind of a ritual in one of the Shinto shrines. Uh, and then I began to investigate what she told me and I found out a few things that I'll show you tonight. And again, um, I, I'm gonna show you the facts. And in the end of the session, in the end of, the, of this lecture, you. I'm, you can uh, decide for yourself if you believe the theory, the theme, which is behind the whole thing, or, or not. Uh, it's up to you. Anyway, we all know Japan. We all know this is a very interesting country. It's a, it has some kind of dualism. It's, on one hand, Japan is a very uh, sophisticated and high-tech 
developed country, uh, a very high standard of living, uh, Western culture. It is on one hand, one side of Japan. The other side of Japan is the country of the uh, pagodas, the country of the uh, ninja, of the samurai. Ninja, not the ninja that is shown on television. It's in real ninjas and the samurai and uh, ancient and old tradition, kimonos, uh, eating uh, uncooked fish and living in uh, paper and uh, wooden houses. This is Japan, a both of both sides combination. And uh, I want, for the beginning, just as a teaser, I want to show you uh, some, a little, little clip that will bring us into the subject. And it's a surprise. Because, because, uh, and, 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 I'll, and I'll explain to you uh, what this surprise is about. But let me first give you a description of a ritual that takes place in, uh, in a temple, in the shrine, in a Shinto shrine, once a year. And if this, if the description of this ritual, if it, if it reminds you of something, then it's on your responsibility. But it goes like this. In the middle of the shrine, they bring in a boy, about 13, 14 year old boy, and he is tied to a like kind of a, a piece of wood, of like a, a, a pillar of, of wood, not a pillar. A, uh, Amud Etz, uh, a pole, a log of wood. And he's tied behind his the hands behind him. He is brought into the middle. One of the Shinto priests comes in. He has a wooden knife in his hand. And he is doing a, a, like a movement, like he's going to slaughter or to stab the, the boy. Another priest comes from the other side. And he shouts at him, don't touch the boy. Don't do him any harm. Now, I'm sure this, this kind of ritual reminds you of something very familiar. And I'm sure if, I, if you unmute, you all say, what is it? Akedat Yitzchak. Very similar to what's happening in Akedat Yitzchak, right? So this boy, after the ceremony, becomes uh, sacred, and he has the ability to do wonders. He's, he's considered in his village to be a, a very uh, important person. The end of the ritual, when they untie the boy from, uh, from, the, uh, from the pillar, they sacrifice 75 rams. This is the sacrifice that they, they sacrifice like korban, uh, lamizbeach, uh, 75 rams. And uh, so this is Akedat Yitzchak, which we all, all, all uh, know. And uh, this is the end of the ritual. Now, this ritual is called Ontosai. Ontosai lasts for thousands of years in a mountain in, in a shrine. Now the name of the shrine of the name is, is like the name of the mountain. And the name of the mountain in Japanese is Moriya. That's the name of the mountain, Moriya, mountain of Moriya. So it's written there in Japanese, mountain of Moriya. 
This uh, uh, shrine is called Sua Taisha, it's in the central of Japan. And the ritual is taking place in between March and April. March and April, which is very, uh, maybe mostly April, which is close, very close to our Chag Pesach. Because as we know, the Japanese calendar goes according, according to the moon, very similar to the Hebrew month, the Jewish month, which goes according to the moon. So and, uh, we all know that Akedat Yitzchak, when did it occur? When did it happen in Akedat Yitzchak? Akedat Yitzchak, according to the tradition, is very close, is in Chag Pesach. This is the most important ceremony in Suat Aisha. Suat Aisha is the mo- one of the most important uh, um, um, shrine of the Shinto shrines, like it's, it's a complex of four shrines. I, happen, I, I, I went to visit there, and I met um, a, a, a person, he is a publisher, he is the investigator, he is this researcher of, uh, and, the, and the owner of a local publishing company called Remnant Publishers, his name is Arimasa Kobo, you can see him in the picture. And he showed me around, he took me all around uh, the, the shrine, told me about the rituals, told me about what's going on. And he is now, I, I took a picture of him near the mountain, the Moria Mountain, Moria Mountain. And uh, he, um, the, the name of the, of, the, uh, uh, of the ritual is also called Moriya no Kami. Kami, Kami in Japanese is the god. You know, in Japan, you have like about a million gods in Shinto, million gods, and they, they are call, all called Kami. So Moriya no Kami is the god of this mountain. And he, and the whole ritual is in the name of Moriya no Kami. And this Arimasa Kobo may a uh, began to make an investigation, and he researched it, and he le- researched, and he learned, and his theory is that the Japanese are actually the descendants of the 10 tribes, the 10 tribes uh, that were exiled from Yehuda v. Israel. The first exile was by the Assyrian in uh, the year 721 BCE. The second one was by the Babylons in 586 BCE. And they are actually the descendants and he, uh, of, of the, uh, and the Japanese are the descendants of these 10 tribes. Now, what kind of proof does he have or all the, the people who believe are the, the, the Japanese are the descendants of the 10 tribes? Uh, and uh, there is a lot of uh, history involved and in following what's written in the Tanakh. Uh, you know that the first, the first uh, exile, as I said, was in the year five, 721 by the king of Assyria, Ashur, Piglat Pil Eser. And in Kings, in Sefer Melachim, uh, we read that in the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria took Samaria, and carried Israel away onto Assyria and placed them in Chalach and in Chavo on the river of Gozan and in the cities of Madai. Now these names, the Tiglat Pil Eser III, who took the Jews from Eretz Israel to exile to the east, he conquered parts of Eretz Israel at that time, uh, 734, 732. He conquered parts of Eretz Israel. He exiled the Jews to the east, and he put them in some places, Chalach uh, v'Chavor. Chavor actually is the north part of Mesopotamia, and Chalach uh, and uh, and uh, Nin and uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, Chavor is the end, is the is the north part of Mesopotamia, and Chalach is north of Nineveh. You can see here the map: uh, Israel in captivity. Uh, and Madai, Madai actually is Iran of today. So he brought the Jews and put them there and, and, and settled them in these, um, in these places. Now the exiles, uh, they arrived in Iraq or in Iran, today is Iraq and Iran, all these places. 
uh, are in Iraq or in Iran, they were assimilated. These were the parts of the first exile. So what you can see in the purple route, these are the Assyrians that took the Israelites into captivity. And then the second part of the Galut, second part of the exile, was in the sixth century before BCE, when the Babylons took Judah and parts of Benjamin also, Binyamin v. Yehuda, they took them into captivity and they brought them into uh, Iraq. You know that for years, uh, many scientists and historians try to uh, see where the, uh, the footsteps of these 10 tribes that uh, disappeared. And uh, a lot of, uh, they, they try to do some uh, uh, investigations in the medievals and the, uh, the modern time. And from time to, you know, we all, always hear that new tribes were discovered and uh, all tribes in all kinds of minhagim, customs, with Jewish minhagim that we, we find them in, in the uh, jungles of South America, we find them in Africa, we find them in Asia, in Cuchin. A lot of books, a lot of movies uh, were uh, uh, produced about uh, the, the mystery, where have all these 10 tribes disappeared? There, is, there was a rabbi in Israel named Rav Eliyahu Avichail that he uh, actually gave a, gave a heksha. Yeah, I think he passed away a year ago, two years ago. He was the, one of the biggest Jews, Jews discoverer uh, that he found all kinds of, of, of of, of, of tribes or Jewish, uh, they consider themselves to be Jewish communities. In many places, one of the most famous one is the one that he found in Kuchin, in India, and he gave them a hechsher that uh, they be they are real, really Jewish, and they some of them even were brought to Israel and they live in Israel until until today. So actually, uh, uh, along the history, we had many books and writings and descriptions of all kinds of communities. This, they found them in several places in the world. And they all claim that they are the descendants of the 10 tribes beyond the river of the Sambation, according to a legend. They all were taking broad don't believe there's Sambation. Nobody knows where the river of Sambation uh, actually is. And uh, you know, El Dada Dani in the 9th century, and David Aruveni in the 15th century talked about kingdoms, whole kingdoms of, of Jewish tribes. Also Binyamin Metudela, the famous traveler, Binyamin Metudela in the 12th century. And Binyamin Asheni in the 19th century. And uh, Mendele Mocher Sfarim wrote about Binyamin Ashlishi, even though he never left Russia. So on the way, on going to the East, why won't they end up actually in Japan? Now, we have um, a, uh, an author, by the name, a professor by the name of Avigdor Shachan. He wrote a book towards the Sambation, and he has a theory that the th this theory is telling us that they, um, these tribes, these Israelites, wanted to go back to Eretz Israel after the exile, after years, but they couldn't. Nobody let them. They knew that if they head back to the West, they won't be let go through. So they decided actually to go around. And they made the mistake that Columbus did in the first place. They wanted to go all around. They said, if we can't go back straight West, we can make like a, 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 a turn around, go East, go South, and then we'll head back to the West. You know, in those times, nobody knew that they, uh, the world is, uh, is round. Uh, they thought that they, uh, there, there is a, like the upper hemisphere. There are many theories how the, how, the, how, how the world looked like at that time. But this is, they say they were going to go east. There are the mountains of the Himalaya in the east. We're going to bypass them to go from the south, like in Korea. And they began to go to, to wander and to leave their places and wander and go to the east. And they arrived also, and they arrived in Japan. And when they arrived in Japan, 
according to our Professor Avigdor Shanan, he says that, uh, Ashachan, I'm sorry, Avigdor Shachan, he says that they actually settled there and assimilated with the local people that lived in Japan. Now, if we ask a Japanese today, when actually was the beginning of the Japanese nation? When did the Japanese nation actually was, 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 was founded, was, was uh, established? They will tell you that the Japanese exist in the world since the 7th or the 6th century BCE, which is about the same time of Galut Shalbait Rishon, 6th and 7th century or Actually, this is the Galut of Bayit Rishon. So they say they, the dates match or when the creation of the Japanese nation and the Galut of Bayit Rishon, when these exiles came into the East and came into Japan. Also, their assimilation involved also some kind of cultural assimilation. For example, a lot of Hebrew words entered the Japanese language. And not also words, also some of the Hebrew script. Now look, this is a, this is a sign that this is a, a board that I took a picture in, uh, it was, it's a karaoke place in, 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 in Tokyo. But you can read it, it like it's in Hebrew. What can you read? Matechet maniac, right? You, read, you see like Hebrew letters very similar to the Hebrew letters. These are Japanese, actually in Japanese you read from left to right, yes. But if you, if you look at it, it looks very much like, um, like uh, Hebrew letters. So a lot of, of Japanese, you know, Japanese, uh, the Japanese letters and the Chinese letters are the same, but there are also about 150 forms of Japanese letters. This is one of them. There are many other forms of Japanese letters, of Japanese script. So one of them, or a few of them, are very similar to some of the Hebrew letters. So it's very uh, interesting. For, let's take an example. Uh, the thing that you see now. You see a gate, right? This is a gate to the Suataisha uh, uh, that I mentioned before, the, the, uh, the, the shrine. Every shrine in Japan has the same shape, like what you see now in the picture, in this picture. In Japanese, the, um, the gate is called tori. The name is tori. Tori, it's very similar to the Aramaic word tara, which is sha'ar. Tori, tara, sha'ar, gate in Hebrew. And I'll give you some, some more example of, of Hebrew words that then went into the, that entered the Japanese language later, but I want to go back for a second, for a second to uh, one of the points that I mentioned before in this, you know, the Akedat Yitzchak uh, ritual, which is, I said that after they untie the boy from the board, from the pillar, the pillar is the word, I don't know. If you untie the board, I, I tie the boy, they sacrifice 75 rams. Now I asked, uh, Mr. Kobo, why 75? And also there is a little museum there. I'll show you a picture from the museum later. And he told me uh, because 75 is a, a, is a number that uh, repeats itself in many places in the Jewish uh, tradition. For example, there are uh, 75, the 75 is the number of Bnei Israel who went into Egypt with Jacob. Wait a second. It's not true. I mean, the, the Tanakh is telling us, the Torah is telling us, that there are only 70. Shiv shiv im nefesh yardu b'nei Yisrael mitzrayma. Not 75. So something is wrong here. You have the wrong interpretation. And he said no. And he opened up some documents and, and, and his book, the book he wrote. And he said, you know, the, um, the, uh, one of, the, of, the, of Jesus' uh, uh, disciples uh, by the name of Stefan, Stefan, he was the, one of the disciples of Rabban Gamliel who became Christian. 
And he was one of the, those who wrote the Septuaginta. The Septuaginta is the, the, the Targum, the translation of the Bible that were given to 70 Chachamim, and they all translated it into 70 languages. And in the uh, Greek language, in the Septuaginta, if you open up and you see that the, the, there it says that the number of Bnei Israel who went into Egypt is 75. Now, the Septuaginta is the Greek translation of, of the Bible from the time of Jesus. Yes, we're talking about 2,000 years ago. And there, and this is the, actually, the Greek uh, 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 version was the one that Bnei Israel went into the exile in those times in the 7th, 6th, 6th, 7th century BCE. This is the script that they had with them. And, and uh, uh, so they, will, they, they, they believed what it's in the Bible is written 75. So this is the source of these 75 rams that they, uh, by the way, also in the hidden scrolls that, we've, that were found in Yama Melach, you have the translation that says that the number of Bnei Israel went into Egypt is 75 and not 70. I don't know how this mistake or, or mismatch happened, but this is in the Greek translation of the Bible. It's all 75. So this is why they have 75 uh, uh, rams sacrificed. Also, there, the number 75 uh, appears in many other places. And uh, I will not... Uh, uh, this is the Septuaginta here. This is the, this is the, uh, the copy of the, of the Greek translation. Of the, of the Bible, with the number 75, the number of Bnei Israel that went into Egypt was 75. Now, if you look at this picture here, this is the, from the little museum that is in, near the, this, the shrine. You see the ram, and you see that his right ear is cut. And why is it cut? And he explained, Kobo explains to me, because you know, according to what's written in the Bible, when Abraham Avinu took the ram, and he uh, wanted to sacrifice it. The, the ram was actually uh, was, uh, um, um, stopped, or was um, um, uh, got, got, got um, caught in a bush, and the, the bush cut his ear. So this is why the, this ram, uh, the ear was cut. Another thing he explained to me also was the name of this ritual. The name of the ritual is Mi Isakuchi. This is the Japanese name for thousands of years. Mi Isakuchi. Now, Mi is big. Chi is like a suffix to a word. Uh, many, many words in Japanese end with the Chi. Now, if you take out the Mi and the Chi, in the middle you have Isak. Isak, Itzhak. You can see the similarity. So this is Mi Isa Kuchi. And in the, if you go, if you ever arrive there, you know, you go into, go into the museum, you'll see a lot of pictures uh, of, the, of, the, um, of, the, um, of the ritual. Um, by the way, in the time of the Meiji, uh, uh, in the 19th century, there was a Meiji uh, period, called the Meiji period of, of Japan, which, in which Western ideas came into the country and people uh, began to believe in more universal values and, uh, you know, feeling sorry for the animals to so sacrifice 75 rams at one time is unhuman. You can't do that. And human rights and animal rights. So uh, they replaced them. And this is a picture of the ceremony that is taking place today. Today, you don't tie the boy anymore to the spiller because it's unhuman and you can't do that, and you don't slaughter 75 rams, and what you bring into the shrine is just the wooden pillar without the boy. You do this whole, the whole thing, the whole ceremony is taking place, as you can see in the picture, but uh, you never tie a boy to it, and you never sacrifice 75 uh, uh, rams. And what you do, you take like uh, uh, stuffed animals, stuffed rams, and you put them on the shrine, as a substitute, what you can see in the other picture, in the lower picture, you put it as a substitute to the, um, 
uh, for the uh, for for the for the actual rams that were sacrificed. Now, in order to understand the the uh, the religion and the similarity with the Judaism, we should understand a little bit about the Shinto. You know, they say about the Japanese that they are born believing in Shinto and they are buried like Buddhists. The name Shinto is the way of gods. That's the translation of the name Shinto. And since the 19th century, this is the dominating uh, religion in Japan. Actually, it's a it was a, a political uh, um, a, a, a political move to give back the emperor its power that was lost. You know, in for eighty years it was a feudal feudal uh, uh, system in Japan, and uh, the real power was in the hand of the of the landlords of the of the samurai, and 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 having a, a uniting religion like the Shinto was supposed to mean giving back the power to the to the emperor and any other religion that interferes uh, has to be demolished this is why the Shinto actually they they slaughtered the Buddhists and they burned their their uh, their uh, temples and their shrines not shrines of the Shinto Temple is Buddhist. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the difference in a few minutes. And there was a lot of violence against the monks, the, the Buddhist monks, um, until the Shugon declared peace and uh, made a sort of a reform in the, in the Kami uh, uh, ritual. And they say, okay, now we're going to have some kind of a religion which is mixture of Buddhism, but... They're very, very, and, and both of them are legitimate. So whoever wants to be Shinto can be Shinto. Whoever wants to be Buddhist can be Buddhist. And you can move. You can, you can people decide that they want to, to be Shinto, they can be Shinto. Other ones want to be Sh Buddhist, it's okay. But every shrine or every temple has to decide to which religion he belongs. He can be Shinto and he can be uh, 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 um, uh, a Buddhist. What's the big difference? And now I come to the point which is important for us. A Shinto shrine has no statues whatsoever. If you go into a Buddhist temple in Thailand, in Cambodia, all over Asia, you go, or in Japan, if you go into the Buddhist temple, Everything around is Buddha, 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 Buddha. In many shapes, in many forms, in many movements, in many gestures, and each one means something. In Shinto, no statues. They believe this, that the God has no shape. Their God, the Shinto gods, the Shinto gods don't have the kami don't have a body, and you can imagine the body because they are invisible. And this is, was some of the changes that were made during the years. And uh, 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 this is also something that, if you can think about it, uh, we also believe that the God doesn't have a body and no shape of a body. Now look at these pictures. You can see uh, when you pass the Tori, you can see um, I, I, there is a picture of only one of them. There are two lions, one on the left, one on the right. Before you enter the shrine, you have two lions, one on the left, one of the, uh, uh, on the right. The one on the right has his mouth open as if he's saying, ah. And the one on the left is, is his mouth closed as if he's saying, hmm. Now, there are no lions in Japan, no lions in Japan. So why do they put lions? So this is, this is also some of the things that they say, uh, what, what he explained to me, is when ah, ah is the first pronunciation, mm is the last, from open to close, because like, like they say, he, this is symbolizes God. God, he is the only one God, the first and the last. Okay, during the, in the beginning, he told me, the Japanese believed in one God. 
They didn't have million gods like today. They believed in one God. During the years, with assimilation, with getting other cultures going to the, into Japan, they, and, and also Buddhism, they, also, they began to believe in many gods. And today, as I said before, there are about million gods. But in the beginning, there was one god from the beginning, from Ah, from the first letter to the last pronunciation with the mouth closed. The god is, the, is only, only one. He is the first and he is the last. In other shrines, you can see a lion, Gur Arye Yehuda, and a unicorn. Why a unicorn? A unicorn reminds them of a show of an ox. Who is an ox in our tradition? Yosef HaTzadik. Yosef B'chor Shoro Hadarlo. So they considered a unicorn Yosef and Gur Arye Yehuda, a lion on the other side, so this is, what you, this is what you see when you enter a Shinto shrine. Before you enter the shrine, you have to to wash your hands. There is like a kiyor, there is like a sink and water, and you have to do uh, the netilat uh, yadayim. And also, you can see on the side, maybe, I, I don't know if it's here or it's in the other, no, it's in the other picture. There is one thing which is very, very, very Jewish near the netilat yadayim. This is the, what we call in spoken Japanese, a pushke. To put money, donations, you know, kupa, tzedaka, to give it tzedaka. So always this is part of the shrine. Then you, may, you move on and you see these pieces of paper that people write what they wish, all kinds of wishes and prayers and the things that they, uh, that they, they pray for. Put them, put them on pieces of paper and hang them um, on, the, on the Shimanawa. Shimanawa is like a curtain, which actually is the border of the, of the shrine. So on this side, before the Shimanawa, you put the, the, these, these papers. And this is the, uh, 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 the Chol, the, 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 the non-sacred place. And when you, once you cross it, you get, go into the holy place part of the uh, shrine. And then you see trees. Four, actually four trees. Uh, they called the name, the Japanese name, that they, are, they are pine trees, but the Japanese name is Hashera. Hashera. Does it ring a bell? You remember how they, uh, the, the trees that are uh, uh, dedicated to Avodah Zarah are called in our Torah Asherah. You know the word Asherah. So these, these trees are called Hasherah in Japanese. Now you see the steps. These are old steps from the beginning of the shrine hundreds of years ago. And you all go, you go all the way up to the Jukorno, Jukarno. This is the main hall of the shrine. And then you arrive at the shrine, and then you can see something very, very amazing. Every shrine in Japan has the same measurements, same midot. We have about 4.4 4, 4 meters on the width and 13.30 meters uh, uh, length. Now, if you translate it into the ancient midot that we have, amot, according to the regular measurement, you know that uh, how much is a, is a amash, shim centimeter, something like this, you find a accurate similarity between the midot, the measurements of the Shinto shrine and the Israeli mishkan in the desert, the tabernacle, the mishkan. Also, you can see here the comparison, how they look like holy place, and then you have the holy of the holiest. The same thing in the Israel, in the Mishkan, that we have the holy place and the holy of the holiest. And then, all around, there are trees, there are cypresses, and you can read here the, uh, the, uh, the description of the Mishkan, of, of the Beit uh, HaMikdash, um, uh, that built by Shlomo HaMelech, 
that were built from cypresses and cedar wood, cedar trees, and all of them are made without nails, without metal nails, like the Mishkan Shlomo. There is a roof, and in ancient times, instead of a roof, they had uh, like uh, uh, badim, uh, clo uh, materials uh, uh, covered the, the, uh, the amudim, the pillars that surround the Mishkan. It's the same, very, very similar things to the tabernacle that we had in the desert. And also in Kodesh HaKodashim, you have uh, open in the east, and the high priest of every shrine, can you guess how many times he enters the place which is called the Holy of the Holiest? Can you guess? Raise your finger if you know. Like you are all muted, so I don't know. How many times a year? Can I see your fingers? I don't see your picture, so I don't know. You, you, I think, right, exactly. I see one picture here. Exactly. Once. The high priest enters the Holy of the Holiest once a year to, sac to bring sacrifice, to bring donations to the, to, the, to the gods. And there is an altar, a stone in the middle of the shrine. There is a stone in which you bring, you put the, the, um, the sacrifice to the god uh, Mori. Then you have, you can see, uh, these are some pictures that I took. Uh, there, not, there, wasn't, there was not a, a, a ritual when I was there, but all the priests and all the people are around are uh, maintaining the, uh, the, the, the shrine. And here we can see in this picture, there are barrels of sake. Sake is the Japanese wine made of rice. So, you know, they, he's, again, he's, he's making these comparisons. Uh, what they do with this wine, why are there so many barrels of wine in the Shinto shrine? Because they don't drink the wine before they go into the, 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 the ritual. They, they stop for the people who are coming. They're not giving uh, uh, kibud, uh, refreshments and wine to the people who are coming, uh, worshiping in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the shrine. This is what they pour on the Mizbeach. Lenasech, like we, menaschim yain ala Mizbeach. Or we do sometimes, sometimes wine, sometimes water, but we also put wine. Menaschim yain. We do wine on the Mizbeach in the times when Beit HaMikdash existed. So this, this, this um, wine, sake, is poured on the, on the Mizbeach in parts of the uh, ritual. And also um, uh, salt as well. They put also salt. You find the pasuk, the similar pasuk in the Torah about Melach that is put on the Mizbeach. And what about animals? What about sacrificing animals? They're not sacrificing animals. And I asked him, you know, if, if the ritual, if the custom in the Beit HaMikdash was to uh, sacrifice animals, like sheep, like cows. So why don't you sacrifice animals? And he told me, you know, there is a, a pasuk in Sefer Dvarim that says, be careful not to sacrifice your burnt offering, uh, offerings any, anywhere you please. You can do these uh, sacrificing uh, only in Beit HaMikdash in Jerusalem. No, we are not in Jerusalem. We are in Japan. So you're not allowed to do it uh, any, any place else. The Torah is, forbids us from giving uh, uh, any sacrifice, any animal sacrifices, any place outside of Jerusalem. This is why we don't do it here. Another thing is, as I said, you have nothing there. No statues, no sculptures, nothing to worship, nothing physical that they bow to and they, and they, and they, and they uh, uh, worship. What represents God? We, we have, uh, in, in, in the tabernacle, in Beit HaMikdash, in Namishkan, we had the Aron Abrit, and uh, we had a lot of other things. Um, and they have one thing, a mirror. The mirror represents God, any God. They put a mirror in the center of this Holy of the Holiest. What is it? Why a mirror? Because what do you do in the mirror? I mean, you look in the mirror, you see yourself. You say, God is in everyone. If you look at the mirror, you see yourself. This is actually, it symbolizes God. God is you. You are God. 
the God, you, you identify yourself with God. So this is why they put uh, a mirror. And uh, I, I mentioned before, there are some words that uh, enter the Japanese language. Uh, for example, how do you, how, if you want to say, uh, an emperor in Japanese is Mikado. Mikado, he says, is very similar to the Hebrew word Migadol. Okay? If you want to believe, you can believe in it. What is a Nusi? President. Nasi. Tori, I mentioned before. The Tara. And uh, also, the two, the, 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 when we talk about the, 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 the Tori and the gate, you can see the uh, two pillars that are the Tori is built of. They actually, they say that they are um, uh, similar to Yachin veBoaz, the two pillars that Shlomo HaMelech put at the entrance of Beit HaMikdash. I asked uh, Kobo, uh, what, why, did you, why, why did you start the whole thing? What, what, what make, made you believe that uh, you, really the Japanese are, are the descendants of the 10 uh, tribes, of the Seret Ashretim? And he said that it was um, research that he read by a uh, scientist, by the historian by the name of Yosef Edelberg. He's a Jewish writer who lived in Japan. He learned Shinto, he published a lot of books and, and, and uh, essays. And he gave, a, in, he, in his book, he mentions the whole, all the things that we're talking about now. Also, he gave a list of 5,000 words that came from, uh, from, um, from Hebrew into the uh, Japanese language. Also, I'm sure you all heard about the bar, Rabbi Marvin, uh, Marvin uh, Tokayer, your Rabbi, Rabbi Tokayer, who also uh, made, uh, wrote about it. He, he also mentioned the uh, similarity, the similarities between the Shinto, between the Japanese and the Jewish history and the Jewish uh, tradition. And he found a lot, a lot of similarities. You can read uh, his book as well. So Kobo began to believe in it, to research, to make a research, to investigate, and he found out uh, all these, um, uh, all these proofs that we are talking uh, about. And also one more thing, you know, uh, there is a bell when you want to enter the, the Shinto shrine, there is a bell, you know, like uh, telling the, the gods, here we are, we are arriving, we are coming in, be ready for us. And also we can uh, remember the perush of the, Ram, the Rambam that says that HaKohen HaGadol, why did he have bells in his rope? Also when he rings, he like asking for permission. He's ringing, he's telling Kadosh Baruch Hu, I'm entering the Mishkan, I'm making a sound and be uh, ready. When you ask a Shinto priest, are you really part? Are you are you are the descendants? Is your religion uh, 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 an outcome uh, 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 descends from from the Hebrew tradition, from the Jewish tradition? They would say no way. They will deny everything. And the thing is that about the Shinto, they don't have uh, something in writing. Nothing is written there, and people go. And this is tradition that it's an oral tradition. It goes from generation to generation. And now if they want to be a priest, they go to the uh, university and they learn Shinto in university and get the degree. Another proof that he showed me is, uh, is a scientific proof about DNA tests that were made. All the nations that consist, the, 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 the Japanese nation, they, they actually, the, the Far East nations, the Koreans, the Chinese, and they found, and, and 40% of them, they have a different genetic compound. Uh, 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 compound. And they, the Japanese belong to a very rare group. They have a subgroup D, I, I'm not such an expert in, in, in genetics, but they have the subgroup D of the chromosome Y. Only a very few tribes in the world belong to this subgroup. Amongst them is the Jewish nation. And they found this in Jewish from the East and from Europe and from America and from Israel or from Yemen. 
And the same subgroup consists also 40% of the Japanese nation. This is something uh, genetic that uh, they, they, they found a few years ago. Then I went to another shrine. It's called Ise Jingo, four hours from Tokyo. And I met uh, another, and this is the bell that I uh, talked about. And there, this is the other, the other shrine, the Ise Jingo. And I met, I met a guy, a very nice guy, Hideo Hatakada. He was born Shinto, and then he went to New Zealand, and he became a Christian. It's hard to be a Christian in Japan, by the way. And he told me the history of this shrine. And Ise Jingo was built in 4th century BCE by Yamatohama no Mikoto. This is the daughter of the emperor. And she built this shrine in honor of the goddess Amatraso. Amatraso means the glory of heaven, the, 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 the light of heaven. And uh, according to the uh, Japanese tradition, she hid in a cave and didn't, didn't want to come out. But the moment she went into the cave, because she was the goddess of the sun, the sun didn't shine anymore. And the whole world was dark. And until another monk by the name of Kuyana came and he told her a few words and he told me the few words, the 10 words as like counting the Hebrew letters, the Hebrew numbers, very similar to the Hebrew letters. If I tell you that you, you, you have to have a very strong imagination to believe that they, they are really Hebrew words. But he said 10 words that made her come out and then the sun began to shine again. So according to the Japanese tradition, this Amatraso came out and this, this temple, the shrine, was built in her uh, 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 honor. Now they told me, you know, this shrine is built, it is destroyed every 20 years. They destroy it and built it from the beginning next Near, 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 near the, the old location. So why? So I don't know. This is the tradition. They build the shrine. After 20 years, they destroy and build a new one. And then I asked I, I, I didn't know to explain. Later on, I found out that they believe that they, when they looked at the, at the Bible, you can find that uh, 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 Mishkan, after it was brought to Eretz Israel, and Arona Brit that was taken from place to place, never stayed in one place more than 20 years. The longest that it stayed in one place before it was moved to another place, until Shlomo HaMelech built the, 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 the temple in Jerusalem, it was maximum 20 years. So they say this is why we rebuild this temple every 20 years from the beginning. And they have a ritual in this uh, uh, temple, this shrine, when they have Aaron. Now look at the Aaron, look at the Aaron, look at the, at the, at the, at the uh, uh, how do you call it, the case, or say, Carol, how would you say Aaron? Aaron, like Aaron Abrit, the unmute, help me with the word, Aaron. Uh, it's not a cupboard, it's a... A coffin? About, it's not a coffin, it's not to, to bury the dead. This is like Aron Abrit, like the Aron the Bnei Israel had in the, in the tabernacle. A case. Uh, An ark. Ark, ark, that's the word, yeah, that's not the word I was looking for. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Anonymous. Uh, the ark. They have these arks here, uh, and they, there's a whole ritual, not only here, also in Kyoto, in other places in Japan, in which they have all rituals carrying these arcs, and uh, they bring into the river, the Isuzu River, and these arcs are considered very to be very, very holy. You know, uh, they were carried the same way. And when, I, when, I, when we were there, we saw a whole parade carrying the arcs the same way that we he, see here in the picture in which the our ark was carried by the Kohanim. And they sometimes they put it in, uh, in, uh, on the river. Now, when I was there, all of a sudden, some priests came out 
and look what they have on their ropes. Tzitzit. Look all around, they have like tzitzit hanging out of their ropes. And, uh, and, um, uh, so I believe, I, I, when, I, when I saw it on the first time, I couldn't believe my eyes. I mean, look, look at this, what is it? It's like, I, I, then I looked again and I saw only, they don't have four, they have only two. Two tzitziot hanging out from their ropes. Uh, I don't know where it comes, you can guess how it comes for Martin Tokar, Rav Tokayer wrote that their ropes actually like the white clothes of the Kohen, of the Kohanim, and they have also other signs, other, 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 other uh, costumes, other parts of, 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 of the things they dress that have a lot of similarity. For example, you have like a square uh, uh, material, square material on their chest, which is considered like a fod. Now look, they have mitzvah fod, they have hats, and they have a big belt, chagorat bad ava, and uh, this is how the kohanim are dressed there. They, they, the priests are dressed in, in Japan. And this tzitzit really amazed me. I asked them, what is it? He said, this is an old tradition. You know, uh, when I was there, they, they, uh, uh, some businessmen came with so very uh, 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 expensive cars. They stopped there in suits. Uh, they came into the shrine and they were allowed, they, they were led in and they began to, they, they bowed their heads and they prayed and they held a whole ceremony. You know, what I told you in the beginning, there is a, a mixture of Western culture and tradition and the country of tradition. So you see the, the symbol of the, of, of the West, of the West, like these businessmen, look, businessmen to me, they, they not involved in religion, whatever. And they went into these shrines and, and they prayed and they bowed and they uh, did the whole ceremony, the whole traditional ceremony in front of these uh, priests. Strangers are not allowed to uh, to enter into the shrine, only to stand from the uh, from the outside. We have the Israel ambassador Eli Cohen, and he told he he is he's a Cohen. Eli Cohen is a Cohen, and he refused to bow his head when he entered. He refused to bow his head. Uh, he said, I don't do it." But then he said, "No, no, you you're not worshiping. Just it's it's a gesture of honor, and uh, this is how he." Uh, agree to do it. Now, what do you see here? Also, something that you can buy uh, in the in the store next to the uh, in, in 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 the shrine. And uh, this uh, piece of uh, paper, you know what you do with it? You buy it, and then you fold it. And where do you put it? On your door. On your door, near next to to the entrance to the to the house. Well, you know what it is. And uh, when you all go outside, you can see, you cannot may have any mistakes by uh, observing this mark on the stones of the pillars that are outside. But they are uh, more modern than the uh, ancient, uh, ancient, um, ancient uh, 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 shrine. Now, uh, some rituals, these are pictures from the ritual that is taking place in Kyoto. Uh, this was the uh, capital of Japan for 974 years. This is where they keep the old tradition. It's called the Gion Jinga. If you remember those who were in Japan, you remember the Gion area. They, they would do all the parades. Look at how they dressed, how their shirts are with the black stripes and what they're carrying, carrying arcs. But their arcs are decorated. Now they have also carriages that look like they... Jewish arcs, and uh, they celebrate it on July 17, and uh, you know they uh, also celebrate. They uh, like they say it's part of it's it's a, it's a to remember the Noah's Ark that landed on Harei Ararat, uh, and they call it Uji Mashia, Uji Mashia, Mashia, Mashiach. If you want to believe, this is comes from the first. Uh, uh, from the first, from, from the same uh, source, 
you're allowed to believe. And uh, they take a big arc, the Omikoshi, and the, oh, by the way, the measurements of these arcs are the same measurements as, as, as they are in the Torah for the Aron Abrit. Same measurements. But instead of having the Kruvim, the angels on top, you have like a bird, like a golden bird, an imaginary a bird, and they are carrying it in the street, in the streets of the, um, and, and dancing. You remember the description of David, David Amelech, who was dancing before Aaron when Aaron was brought to Jerusalem. He was dancing, as all the people are dancing around it, all around. This is a whole uh, uh, festival. And Now, when you look at the boxes and their heads, what does it remind you? What is he wearing? Well, people would say tefillin, right? Tefillin, but only tefillin shel rosh. They don't have tefillin shel yad. They lost it, you know, all the way when you come from Eretz Israel, all the way to Japan, they lost the tefillin of shel yad. So they have only tefillin shel rosh. But this is their traditional uh, uh, custom to wear these things on their heads. What, are, what is there inside? Nothing, just the boxes. This is what they have, and the Yamamushi. And this is also something which is, find it hard to believe, the Yamamushi with the, with the tefillin. And then, a few more things that I can mention. Uh, if you look on the left, you will see the, uh, the uh, flower, a round flower, very similar to one of the stones and the right, the, the pictures on the picture on the right is taken from the wall of old Jerusalem. So this is the Japanese, and this is the one that's in old Jerusalem. And then you have uh, Hasid Gur. Yes, he was he was a samurai from the fifth century from Nara, uh, but he looks also with his a uh, beard very 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 Jewish. And uh, there is a legend about the uh, ninja that they arrived in a place called Tengu to get some, uh, to, the, to, the, to the god Tengu, to get some uh, supernatural flower, uh, powers. And he gave him a scroll with all the secrets to read when you are in crisis. And the name of the scroll is Torah no Maki. Torah no Maki. So whenever a Japanese is in trouble and is looking for an, uh, uh, to, a, a way out from his trouble, he reads the Torah no Maki. This is the name of the book. And there are some other rituals uh, that, for example, uh, when uh, women having a, a period, you don't touch holy, holy uh, article, holy books or holy uh, uh, things in the, in the shrine. And uh, when they have the period, you you can't have uh, uh, relations seven years, seven days after the period, and then you have to go to a, a water, to the river, or to to, to uh, uh, wash yourself in water. And uh, um, uh, when a, a woman is giving birth, she's not allowed to come to the shrine for thirty days up to a hundred days. They don't come to the shrines. And if uh, it's a, if she's a, a, a boy, a baby boy, 33 days. And uh, whoever carried, look, this is very Jewish. Whoever, the first one that is allowed to carry the baby to the shrine is the mother-in-law. Isn't it Jewish? Now I want to tell you, uh, uh, for, I'm almost, almost finishing, uh, and I'll let you ask questions. Uh, but, you know, there are a lot of legends, and every boy and every, every young, uh, uh, every student in, in Japan, uh, actually, he, he matures, he grows on, on these legends, that they say all, all, the, all the Japanese are the descendants of the god Niniji. <coughs> what is the story of Niniji? Niniji came down from heaven. 
but he wasn't supposed to go from heaven. Listen carefully. He wasn't supposed to come down from heaven, only his older brother. But when the brother was busy in preparations, the older brother was, re was, was ready, making preparations to come down from heaven to earth, Niniji bypassed him and came down, and he became the Becho, the first one. This is the number one. <coughs> Niniji fell in love with a beautiful girl, Konohana Sakoyehime was his name, her name. But her father said, you can't marry her. You have to marry her older sister first, because by us, you marry first the older sister. So he couldn't marry her. He had to marry her older sister. And then they had two boys. And the younger one, Yamasaki Hiko, he was chased by his brother. His brother hated him. His big brother hated him. And he had to escape to another country. And the, the, in the other country, he began to find out that he has many powers, uh, mister, mysterious powers. And he, with his mysterious powers, he caused a famine in this country where he lived. He caused a famine. There was a famine in the country that his brother lived. I'm sorry. And because of the famine, the brother had to come to him. And they met, and his brother forgave him. Yamasaki married the daughter of the god uh, of the sea. They had a son by the name of Ogaya Fukiso, Fukiyazo. He had four boys. Two disappeared. The other one, and the, and the, and the, the, this, the younger one, became the emperor, the first emperor of the Japanese nation. Now, if this story, if, if this legend reminds you of any Jewish famous story that we can read in Sefer Bereshit, all this similarity, as I said at the beginning, is under your own responsibility. What gave me the idea that the whole thing that I was talking about in the last hour is really, is something serious. Now, you can doubt it. You can say, you know, it's a, it's a combination of, uh, 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 how do you say, um, uh, by incident, uh, uh, circumstances. Nothing is, 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 is scientific. Nothing is methodical. Could be. But could be also that there is a lot of truth in it. I saw a video when Rabbi, Rabbi Lau visited the Lubavitcher. Now, we don't have to be a Chabadnik to believe that the, that the uh, Lubavitch Rebbe doesn't say things like small talk. We don't have small talk. Everything he says, there is something behind it. Now, I want you to listen to this. This is when Rabbi Lau came to the Lubavitch Rebbe. He wrote a book. He wants to give him his, the book that he wrote. And he told him that the book was translated into Japanese and they, and what the Japanese told him. So you can see that uh, the Lubavitch Rebbe says that you know that the Japanese, part of them, believe they are the descendants of the, of the ten tribes. Now, the, the Lubavitch Rebbe doesn't say things like, uh, you know, without any, uh, it doesn't have, it, it's, it's not used to have small talk. So maybe there is something behind it. I don't know. It's not a scientific proof, of course, but it's very interesting. The last thing that I want to mention, you know, all this, the, the guy here, a very famous one, Chione Tsukihara, who saved thousands of Jews in, the, in World War II by issuing visas to the Lithuanian Jews to escape from the Nazis, and he saved their lives. And when he was asked, why are you doing it? He said, I did what I, I did what I had to do. So maybe people say maybe it's kind of, kind of some kind of a 
Jewish heart that was inside into in, 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 inside Chiyon Tsukihara, who led him to sacrifice his life, sacrifice his career, sacrifice his, his work and, and, and everything in his family, and, and dangerous family, in order to help uh, Jews. So as I said, many interesting, what I gave you here are facts, just facts that in, exist today in Japan. If you want to believe that the Japanese are part, are they descendants of the 10 tribes, you have some facts to support it. If you say the whole thing is uh, BS, you can also think that. It's up to you. Thank you very much for listening to me. If you have any questions, just unmute and I hope I'll be able to hear. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I've spent quite a bit of time in Japan and I know Dr. Akira Jindo. Um, we're very close with the Makuya, not Makoya, Makuya. And um, there, is a, there is a town, I can't remember right now the name of it, right near Osaka. And they have a, uh, once a year, they have a, a little tradition where they take boys who are 13 and girls who are 12 and march them through the town and everybody throws candies at them and they take them to the Shinto to the Shinto uh, shrine where they are where they are blessed by the Kohen Gadol and they have another one in that same place where one family is in charge of a of a cow and about September October the cow was brought to the Shinto temple where the priest puts his hands on the cow and he recites a blessing, and then they take it back to where they live. Yeah. This was discovered pretty much by the uh, by the founder of the Makuya, Professor Abraham Shama, and um, and it was my pleasure to meet a family where the woman, the wife of the family, Miriam Kado, her her maiden name is Ezra for which there is no kanji. There is no calligraphy for her name. And they strongly believe that it comes from... Then France, from the Jewish yeah. origin. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Very interesting, yeah. I didn't know that uh, about, about this. If you have more information, I would love to hear it. I will. I will go to get some material about it. Or you maybe... If you can send us your email, I'll send you some. Okay, okay. I'll... Yeah, Carol's. I'll, I'll send it to you. I'll send it to Carol. Carol, uh, Carol actually has my, my email, so you can send it afterwards if people want to, to see the, the lecture. Uh, by the way, it was recorded, so we can uh, use okay. it. Later. I'll send you the, the recording, the link. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so, wait, if anybody, Michael, if anyone wants to get your email, they should send me an e email uh, right. info at ACI, and yes. um, I can. Give you what's the your, email. What's your email? Oh, you have questions. Carol, what's your email? Info, I-N-F-O, info okay. at aaci.org.il. Okay, thank you. Okay. So, Michael, we look forward to the times when we can travel again. Right, again. <laughs> China, Japan, Russia, South Africa, South America. Dubai, Dubai, the Emirates is the new, the new, uh, you know, uh, new place, the new destination. It was rather shame. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank it was you. my pleasure to see you. Now, now I can see a lot of you. <laughs> I can see our. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Hanukkah Sameach, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Hanukkah Sameach. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. 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 There it's gone. Thank you.